All right, well, let's do it. So today we're very pleased to have uh, Bob Kuka. He is the advisor along with John Baez of our CEO, Brendan, and uh, co-founder of a lot of at least two major parts of applied category theory, um, categorical quantum mechanics and, and linguistics. And he's a chief scientist at Continuum. So a uh, longtime friend and supporter of Topos Institute. So it's great to have you here, Bob. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Thanks everybody. It's, it's about, yeah, I would have expected to have been there physically if it wasn't for a pandemic. No, <laughs> that happened, but okay. So, so a lot of things happened to myself too during that pandemic. Uh, so first of all, I, I'm not at the University of Oxford anymore as faculty. I resigned after 20 years there. Uh, so initially, I ended up in what was called Cambridge Quantum uh, as, as chief scientist. Uh, uh, it was an academically very good offer I got there. I'll explain later. And uh, then something changed. And so we kind of merged with part of Honeywell. So now we got hard, hardware in our in our thing too. So that's pretty cool. Uh, okay, so independent of the global role within the company, I've got an, Ox an Oxford-based team, which is specifically dedicated to what I'm talking about here, this idea of compositional intelligence. And of course, lots and lots of people moved with me from the university, or I brought in brought some people back who were, were somewhere else and things like that. So, so we've got a pretty cool team here. And I mean, this you can build up in a year in industry. It's a bit crazy, but, but okay. Um, okay, let's start. Talk. So, so the, the, the context of my talk is going to be a lot of um, NLP, but also AI more broadly. Uh, actually, so I don't like the name AI. For, um, for, one, for example, a computer used to be a person who did computations. And then when it was replaced by a machine, we don't, didn't call it an artificial computer. So there's really no reason why we should talk about artificial intelligence neither. And that's why we use the term compositional intelligence, just like you got digital computing or analog computing or quantum computing, you get compositional intelligence. So you kind of specify more where the intelligence is supposed to come from. Uh, so the amazing progress in NLP and AI today has been mainly due to a huge increase in computational power, like also the use of GPUs and stuff like that, a huge increase in available data. We've got a factor of a million till not too long ago, and actually much less uh, due to a conceptual paradigm. You can, to some extent, trace neural networks back, back to the 19, 1870s, and as a computational tool, they've been considered since 1940, pretty much. Um, so th this comes with some shortcomings, the current form of NLP and AI, and, and they are very well known. There is the lack of interpretability, which causes lack of verifiability, safety, fairness. Everybody can remember sort of the Microsoft chatbot, which became a fascist suddenly. And uh, that was the end of that sort of experiments. There is humongous cost of data, computation, money, time. The carbon footprint is enormous. Straining GPT-3 costs 12 million in electricity alone. So, so you've got enormous uh, cost in the way things are going now. And uh, very important, I think, for people coming more from a computer science background or, 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 or math background, a structural math background, they would actually, so there is no combinability really with more traditional uh, methods from computer science. Um, thought... yeah, okay. Oh, I hear some noises. I've muted the noise. Sorry about that, Bob. Oh, no worries. So yeah, so there is no combinability with all the other stuff that exists in computer science and, and which actually has resulted in us having stuff like mobile phones and other uh, really cool things. They didn't come out of nowhere. They, they used a lot of formal tools. Uh, so in, in a way, I mean, this is a bit of a metaphor, but I like to compare the current situation with machine learning type AI, with like the success of Babylonian methods. They, they were scientifically very successful and uh, they were kind of laughing at the Greeks at the time. And then Ptolemy was also incredibly successful. And in, in both cases, it was basically statistics driven uh, successes. And typically they have been replaced with other methods or a combination of the two. 
Uh, now, modern computer science deals with the issues, the bad issues I mentioned, using compositionality. Uh, you, you, it, it gives increased uh, interpretability, verifiability, safety, and all that. Um, you can actually combine different metals and methods and tools together in one thing. And uh, writing modern software would simply be impossible without a principle like compositionality. Now, I'm going to get back at the end of the talk to, to this specific point. When we use compositionality, we typically, within computer science, and that's inherited from linguistics pretty much, use the notion of Frege compositionality. And that's the meaning of the whole is the meaning of the parts plus the manner in which these parts are structured together. So that's, that's what typically is meant by compositionality. Uh, and for exa an example, which is going to be important here, is that word meanings plus grammar together give like the meaning of a sentence. Your software within your phone works very compositional. Mathematics itself is totally compositional in, in that way from lemmas. You, you, you prove theorems and things like that by, by stringing these lemmas together. However, this is not how modern machine wor le learning works. This sort of compositionality by understanding the parts you produce the whole is of, is of course not true for neurons because nobody really understands neurons. The neurons like sit inside this black box and the thing just happens to work. And so there it's actually more the opposite, other way around that the whole determines the parts, the whole determines what the bits in the black box are. And uh, I think if you start thinking about it mathematically, you kind of know, see where all these old, uh, what people call GoFi, good old fashioned AI structures, like which are very much based on propositional reasoning, why they don't really fit together. I mean, if you think a little bit categorically, then, then it, it's very easy to see how, why, why category of vector spaces doesn't fit with sort of categories in which these uh, more traditional AI methods uh, fit. Uh, right. So, so now I'm going to tell the story how we try to tackle and combine these two things. Like on the one hand, this, uh, the success of modern machine learning, like the idea of learning methods, and on the other hand, things like compositionality, which have been used in computer science and which have made computer science so successfully. So I'll, I'll, I'll go back a, a bit. So I'm talk, I'll talk about our prehistory. So around 2008 at Oxford University, there were three people. Uh, so there was Mash, uh, Mernouche, and she knew something which, which I refer to now as grammar algebra. Uh, I think a lot of people here have heard about it or seen this in some way or another. Uh, basically, uh, this all goes back to a lot of stuff Lambeck did in the past. His residuate monoids, which are now called Lambeck cal cal calculi or, or his pre groups from 2000s, which uh, in categorical terms, these things are all uh, some kind of monoidal category, which is start of Esposetal and then can't be symmetric for, for, for obvious reasons. The words in language can't just be commuted. Um, so the way this typically works is you got a few notions of type. This could be like a, a noun type or a sentence type. So, and these are your, these are your sort of uh, primitive entities. And then you got some other types which are composed where you use the operations of the particular algebra you have. Like in a, a pre-group is basically something where you got a left and a right inverse, which are not equal as opposed to sort of a group. And then the idea is that, that, that a, sentence, uh, a sentence is something that you obtain if you've got a transitive verb, you've got a transitive verb, the thing in the middle here, and then you put a subject uh, on the left and an object on the right, and then you get a full sentence. And this is then uh, verified by the fact that these two things actually cancel out. So, so this, is a, this is how these grammatical gadgets work. And then in, uh, an important insight for this talk is that you can represent this bit of computation diagrammatically. So here you got the noun of the subject, there you got the noun of the object, here you got the inverses of the nouns within the transitive verb. And by then canceling these two out, which we actually give represent by a cup, so they annihilate each other. And by canceling these ones out, which we also represent by a cup, which annihilate each other, we see that only the sentence type survive. So this means that a noun, a transitive verb, a noun gives you a sentence. So, that, so that's how these grammatical algebras work. Uh, they all work a little bit different. In this case, we use the pre-groups uh, uh, just for the simplicity of the story. Uh, so, okay, so this, this was the sort of thing Marinus did. Uh, the reason she know about this was that Lambeck had just come up with his pre-groups and he wanted somebody to do 
uh, then for a specific case of Persian, and uh, Manoush happened to be Persian, so, so she helped Lambeck out with this thing. Uh, so at the same time at Oxford, there, 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 there arrived somebody new, uh, faculty, that was Steve Clark. Uh, Steve, meanwhile, Steve, uh, Steve so became faculty in Oxford, then he left Oxford for Cambridge, then he left Cambridge for DeepMind, and now he's back in Oxford, but, but with Cambridge Quantum Continuum working with us here. So he did a little bit, a little bit of a detour there. Um, so he, he, this, was, this was 2008, so this wasn't the time yet that deep learning and all that stuff has, has, has taken off so much. So, so the idea to represent meanings by vectors was quite academic still. And so people were working on this thing in an academic context mostly, and Steve was working on this. His previous work was mainly building parsers, which is uh, coming up with ways how to assign these grammatical types I was just talking about to, to, to words in sentences. So anyway, he knew that sort of stuff, these vector space models to assign meanings to words. There was nothing compositional about that at the time. This was just, you have a bag of words and that's how they called it. You have a bag of words and then you try to fit them in some way in a vector space that the, the positioning actually says something about the meaning. Uh, okay, and then there was me. And, and what I was doing at the time was mainly developing categorical quantum mechanics since 2004. Uh, so, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's now... Uh, quite not not closed, but but the nicely rounded subject. So we got our book out, Alex Kissinger and I, which came out in 2007, uh, 2017, I think, and which is which getting increasingly popular in uh, also quantum industry. And then the particular part which is now used a lot in quantum industry is the thing called the X calculus, which uh, Ross Duncan and I came up with. So Ross Duncan is the head of software now in. He left his position in Stratclyde, although Stratclyde is very friendly category theory players, of course, but he lost his position there, left his position to become head of software in Cambridge Quantum Continuum, and he has now a big team in Cambridge. He's not in Oxford, he's in Cambridge now. But so in 2008, we came up with this thing called the X calculus, and now all the major quantum companies are using it for, 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 for different sort of things. So that's pretty cool. Uh, okay, so going back to these two first people, one knew about grammar algebra, which is uh, the structure of, of, of grammatical types in sentences. And the other one who knew about vector spaces is uh, how you represent meanings as vectors. Now, how do you combine the two? How do you combine the two? So Steve asked me, he said, yeah, that's a big problem in, in the field or in, in, in general linguistics. How can we combine these statistical methods with like uh, compositional methods? And I mean, I knew immediately the answer because the answer was given to me a few years before. So in 2004, I was in Montreal and McGill, and uh, I was talking about like quantum teleportation using string diagrams. We just had come up with these things, uh, categorical semantics for quantum protocol, and this in particular included like diagrammatic derivations of things so like teleportation. I was talking the category theory seminar in McGill and I said, hello, I present to you quantum teleportation. And Lambic was sitting in the audience and said, hey, Bob, this is grammar. No, 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 this is physics, this is quantum teleportation. No, no, this is grammar. Ah, you old man, you don't know what you're talking about. Of course, he was right. He was, of course, right because the pre groups, the pre groups, you might, I'll go a little bit back, you might not see, but these pre groups, uh, where, is, where did I give the definition? I think, uh, oh, here, these pre groups, they're just possessive versions of compact closed categories. They're just possessive versions of compact closed categories. And uh, what I'm using here, these string diagrams, uh, that's, that all lives in compact closed categories. So, so basically we were dealing here with the formalism of compact closed categories and what, what lives in the wires, the states which lives in the wires are vectors. So this is a way to combine the structure of language as in compact closed categories with uh, the meanings of language as in vectors. And that was in es essentially what we did in this paper. We basically, uh, Used, used in a way the formalism of categorical quantum mechanics to combine meaning and grammar together in one, in, in a formalism. And um, so, yeah, uh, I think we did this in around 2008. And I'll give you sort of the idea. I mean, it's a very simple idea, of course. Like, more, okay, I'm going to say something mathematically wrong now. Morally, you should think of it as a functor 
from a, a pre-group, which is like a, a post compact category, to the specific category of vector spaces, linear maps, and tensor products. So you take a functor and you map grammar on the meaning spaces. That's, that's, that's morally what you do. Unfortunately, such a functor doesn't exist. And, and the reason is that pretty much everything we do doesn't we don't really do with the partial orders. We actually do it with the, with the freely generated uh, compact closed categories because otherwise there simply doesn't exist a functor. And a lot of other stuff we do, like Frobenius algebra, don't live at the level of the partial order. So, but morally, it's a good way to think anyway. Now, I always think just in terms of diagrams and pictures. So here is a, a thing, a picture, and I can interpret this in two ways. I can interpret this as a linguistic algorithm and I can can interpret this as a physical protocol. Uh, let's start with linguistics because that's, so basically what you've got on top are the meanings of the words Alice, hates, and Bob. So they are vectors, which represent the meaning of these three words. And what you got at the bottom is, you remember this was the diagram we had from, uh, from the pre-group derivation, but you have to think of this now as a linear map, like, a, like the same linear map you, 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 you would have in a, so these are the cups from the vector space structure. They, they really, these things are really two in a, you, you really take partially in a product here and here, and then the sentence skypes come through. And that gives you an algorithm to compute the meaning of the whole, the meaning of this entire sentence from the meaning of the parts, Alice, Hates, and Bob, and the structure how they put together. So you see this is very fragrant. This idea is totally fragrant what's going on here from the meaning of the words and the way they fit together, you compute the meaning of the parts. Now, this, this thing can also be interpreted physically. Uh, you can just think of this as quantum states. You can think of this as quantum states. And then this looks actually like a slightly more sophisticated teleportation protocol where you take Alice and Bob and you, you teleport them through the resort state eight so that they come out as the sentence. So you can interpret this diagram in two different ways. And then so this immediately... This will come back later when we're going to talk about putting this stuff on a quantum computer. Um, okay, so the thing at the time which we were uh, interested in is what people were mostly doing is just taking meanings of vectors and see how related these meanings are. So if you got two synonyms, do you get a, a beginner product? So what we're doing here is we can now do this for meaning of sentences so we can see whether Alice hates Bob and Alice does not like Bob are closely related sentences just by computing an inner product. So that's the sort of stuff you could do. Uh, we, got a, we, got a lot of we got a lot of sort of uh, positive feedback of that word. It was very much uh, respected at the time. Like um, one interesting thing that I should say is when, when we wrote this up, I told like Steve and Maroche, we shouldn't mention that we were inspired by quantum because otherwise we're going to be cr considered crackpots. But of course, all these popular media things, they started to call us quantum linguists and stuff like that. And at the time, we really didn't want that. Okay, so this was then. This was then. We are now, and something has happened. What has happened is, uh, is an AI uh, deep learning revolution. And there's been so much success. There's been so much success since then in the area of machine learning, deep learning. And uh, some of the things we hadn't anticipated, like I said, we were thinking very fragile, for example, you see this. I'm, I'm actually got a table here with how Disco, we, Disco Cat is the name of this, which became the name of this sort of treatment of uh, linguistics. So we had some, some things were good about it and I put them in green. Some things were uh, like the fact that it's nicely interpretable as, uh, as opposed to a black box which you got in machine learning. Uh, we were doing things very fragile, why, why machine learning is now post fragile And there's a few pros and contras for both. I mean, I'm not going to go in detail, but this table is going to come back in many cases. So, okay. So this was the old linguistics uh, type of approach. We got now have started a new one, which um, treats language a bit uh, different than in traditional categorical grammars, like these traditional uh, grammar algebras. Uh, and basically, uh, I, I wrote about this in this paper, which actually appeared in a fresh strip that was still ma that was made for Lambic, and it, it was still being prepared when Lambic was still alive. But uh, of no, 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 it was after so sure. Anyway, it's, it appeared in some Lambic volume that a book that um, Phil Scott and um, uh, uh, Claudia Casadio put together, and and the idea is is, is a bit different. So, and recently, yeah, yesterday, you can see the date, 23, that's yesterday, we actually 
put a new paper together, uh, me, myself, and Vincent and Jonathan, which is like a, a big extension of this idea of um, turning language into circuits. And I'm not talking about sentences anymore. I'm not talking about full text. How you can extend this idea of like uh, grammar algebra to full text. But there are some other key differences I'll, I'll explain later. Let me, let me show you how this kind of works. Um, so let's start with this sentence. And I'm going to do something that turns this into a circuit. So how can I do this? So uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to think of this thick wire in the middle as two non-wires. Think We never said what it was. We said it's sentence type. I say uh, sentence types in this case is two noun types, okay? And then I'm going to sort of put an, an internal wiring, an internal wiring in the, in, in the box of this verb. And I'm putting a dot. You can think of it as a Frobenius algebra or a spider if you want. That's perfectly okay. So I'm, I'm, I make this internal structure into that box. And then I do a bit of yanking. Then I do a bit of yanking. So now you've got this verb and you've got this Alice here. And then it, it's as if like the, the verb grabs, the verb grabs Alice and the verb grabs the bob wire. And so really that's the way you should think about it. You've got Alice is now sort of a wire uh, in a circuit. Bob is a wire in a circuit. And then hates is something that acts on Alice and Bob. It kind of, to use quantum terminology, entangles Alice and Bob in the mode of hating. And, and an amazing thing you can do now is I can start to compose different sentences. I can have Alice hates Bob or Bo and Bob likes beer together in the same circuit. Uh, just as a technical comment, you don't really need these Frobenius algebras to do this, but I find it more insightful. So I kind of wrote on my board here. I don't know whether you can see it because I can't see my own thing here. So you see, I wrote on my board a picture how you can build a circuit really without even putting these dots. But these dots are going to come back later, so I'm putting them now. Yeah? So, so basically, you're turning language into circuits here. Uh, and, and that's kind of a new idea. And, I, and, and this was very undeveloped in this first paper, but now we've we basically got an algorithm that turns pretty much any, any sentence into a circuit of that kind. Uh, we have an algorithm in which we now will understand. Uh, okay. So what are the advantages of doing this, uh, things like that? So an interesting thing is, let me go back to the diagram. A lot of, a lot of the, the way meanings are represented in modern machine learning are static. So GPT-3 was trained before COVID. So GPT-3 doesn't know about COVID because it was trained before and it doesn't adjust. Here, the model is more like, first you start with Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob have nothing to do with each other. Uh, then they get entangled by means of H. I should actually put this, this box of H a bit lower because it's supposed to happen a bit later. You see this? And then, well, uh, because Alice hates him, it starts to like beer. It starts to like beer, and, 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 and he does that then instead. Uh, so you see there's a temporal order, and the meaning of Bob gets updated. First, it gets updated as being hated by Alex. Then it gets updated as liking beer. And so it can go on. So the meanings of Bob will change into the circuit, which is, which is really what, ha what happens with meanings if you read a book. Like you've got your characters and they evolve by, through the text makes the characters of the book evolve. As the text progresses, the characters of the book evolve. So I think that's a cool thing. Um, a very a, a, a thing which I didn't realize in the first paper, and I think which may be very important for application, it's, it strips off what I call language-dependent overheads. What do I mean? Uh, if you look at this grammatical calculi, they, the, the algebra is the same, but of course the way you represent sentences in different languages will be mean uh, different because I love you and je t'aime a very different object subject verb orderings. And every possible object subject verb ordering, the six permutations occurs in some language. They all occur in some language. Uh, so there is something in these grammatical representations we'd have to, which have to account for these differences in all these languages. Uh, there is something else. Uh, I can say Alex, Alex, Alice, uh, like, uh, well, Bob is hated by, okay, let's go back. I can say Bob is hated by Alice and Bob likes beer. Or I can say Bob, who is hated by Alice, likes beer. 
So in one case, I'm talking about two sentences. In, in the other case, I'm talking about one sentence and they exactly say the same thing. So in these circuits, they will become exactly the same. There will be no difference anymore whether stylistically you prefer one or two sentences. So there's a lot of this stuff which is just goes away in the circuits. And I, so basically what we, we have to do to get a perfect mathematical statement is we have, to, we have to cook up our own grammar. And what we did was some sort of Chomsky style generative grammar. This is not a prig, it was Chomsky style generative grammar. And we had to sort of also resolve uh, pronouns like who, relative pronouns like who, and, and then we had to do some other things like some dis disambiguating scopes, but we came up with a fairly, uh, fairly rich grammatical structure, which extended to text. And the reason was because we wanted a mathematical theorem really like of, of a subjective maps, which takes all possible sentences we've, we've given grammatical structure and maps it onto circuits. So a thing like this would be mapped on a circuit like this. So this is the so sentence, uh, sentence, sober Alice who sees drunk Bob clumsily dance, laughs at him. Okay, that's a single sentence. And you get a circuit like sober Alice who sees clumsily Bob dance, uh, laughs at him. And then wait, what did we have drunk? Oh yeah, yeah, and Bob happens to be drunk too, that's there. So, so the content is very much compressed in something that becomes language independent and also style independent and stuff independent. So that's, that's kind of the new thing. And I think to work in NLP, having such a compressed structure uh, of all of language will be a very good thing. Uh, there's other reasons we went to circuits, which, I, which I'll explain later. Um, okay, so this thing is much more interpretable, verifiable, safer, and, and, and fairer than as compared to, say, machine learning ways. Machine learning is still not very good to work with multiple sentences. It, it, it easily sort of, sort of blurs. And so now we have a structure to deal with multiple sentences. So of course, it's going to be cheaper, hopefully, because it's compositional and uh, it combines the best of both worlds. Like uh, it, it, it can accommodate the statistics still. It completely can accommodate the statistics like before with the DiscoCat model, but it's now combinable with reasoning structures. Now, what do I mean by reasoning structures? Uh, I pretty much go back to the same book. This was a book written for physics, but as far as I'm concerned, it's now a book for linguistics as well. All the structures we find in here all the logics we find in here, all the reasoning we find in here, I think is the perfect candidate for now starting a new approach to language. And as we see more later, uh, AI in general to natural language, where you bring reasoning back into the picture. Unlike what you've got in modern machine learning and deep learning, we want to bring reasoning back in the picture without throwing away statistical meanings and all that, without throwing away the machine learning. And I don't know whether, so, so why, why do I call the stuff here in this book a logic? Well, because we've got a completeness theorem, uh, which uh, a lot of people work towards it, but I think the final version is due to these three people, uh, Amar Hadriazanovic, Kang Feng Nang, and uh, Kuang Long Wang. So what they showed is using the diagrams or the reasoning methods from this book, you can reproduce any equation you can prove using Hilbert spaces, tensor product, and linear maps. So you got a complete reasoning structure that, that can reproduce all your equational reasoning, which you can obtain in Hilbert space. So, so I think it's justifiable to call this a new kind of logic, all this sort of uh, stuff we produce to do this category. I mean, m many people are doing stuff like that now in, in the same vein, like, uh, like I saw Robin is here in the, Robin Pierre Deleuze here in the audience, and he's worked with uh, Pavel Sobocinski and, and, and all the people who are now doing this stuff for um, more in computer science. I think it's, it's all, I think it's a new, it's, it, it justifies the name new logic, uh, or unlike, uh, as opposed to like the logic, which is usually associated with the old generation of AI. Okay, back to our table. I mean, I, I'm saying a lot of stuff here. I'm saying a lot of stuff here. So there is one new line here, general text. Yes, now we can do general text, but all the things which were a little bit sort of flawed within the old disco cat moment, they're pretty much all, they're all pretty much like solved now. So ideally, this is better than anything. This beats NLP AI, at least in principle <laughs> on uh, everything else. That happens on the right hand side. There is a caveat. I'm going to tell you about the caveat later. But in this list of, of, of properties I could identify, we beat um, 
machine, we would in principle be meet machine learning everywhere. Okay, now the caveat. The caveat, and I'm starting with, with the term quantum implementations, is if you start drawing these diagrams, they become exponentially expensive on classical hardware. Because uh, you're just tensoring everything together and they can become huge on classical hardware. So, so it, that's a problem. That's a problem. And that was something already Steve and Mernouche realized at the time when they were doing experiments with the DiscoCat model. They had to do a lot of work to get their tensors, to keep their tensors small. I mean, and the, only, the problem they were dealing with, with at the time is that some grammatical types were big, composite types were big, and then just the space to represent those things became very big and sometimes untractable. So you had to start doing certain hacks and stuff. So, the, so they knew this, this problem. And, and I mean, mathematically, it's obvious. Uh, you're working in, you're basically working with a quantum model of language. You're working with a quantum model of language. And just like, uh, I mean, I'll go get back to that later. Like it was said by Feynman, like if you're going to compute with a computer, anything like chemistry or whatever that, 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 that has a quantum description, you better use a quantum computer because your classical computer can't, can't chase it. And this is a true fact, like a, a, a simple molecule like caffeine. Caffeine is not a very big mo molecule, but you can't study it on classical computers at the moment. There's no way you can study caffeine. It's too complex. And it's not very big. And it's because of this blow up, because of the quantum description. And so here we got, what we've got here is basically a, linguist, uh, a quantum model of language. So he wants to be a quantum computer. So, so okay, so in, in 2016, Will Zeng, then a student of me, now Will Zeng is the head of quantum research at Goldman Sachs. So he's with the Big Bang. So Will Zeng was then a PhD student of me. And we basically said, okay, so this stuff wants to live on a quantum computer because otherwise it's, it's just too big to even store. Do we get additional advantages if we stick it on a quantum computer? And uh, we, 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 we came up with sort of one example. If you want to do question answering, so I, I can diagrammatically represent question answering like this. Like you got, you don't, you want to know who hates Bob, who hates Bob. So I represent the, the, the word who by some hole in my diagram, who hates Bob. Uh, then the way you can actually then try to compute this is by basically killing off the sentence type and then maximizing, maximizing what you get here. This is just an inner product. This is a product between hates, whoever you want to test whether they hate Bob and Bob, and then you want to, then you just maximize the solution there, what gives you the, more, the most hatred. And uh, you can show that this gives you a quadratic speed up on a quantum computer if you do that. So this was one, it's a very canonical linguistic task. Another linguistic task is simple classification of words. You would also get a quadratic speed up for that on a quantum computer. So, okay, this, it's not such a stupid idea to think in quantum terms and, and to do all this stuff on quantum computers. Okay, so we can add one line, quantum speed up. Yeah, this coquette then at Groover, uh, because this was just for this coquette that I was spe speaking now. Like, I mean, the, uh, there I'll get back to, like so far, uh, NLP doesn't really have speed up for any kind of talks. And the reason is like, if you represent uh, language in the machine learning way, quantum computers just can't store it at the moment. In, you, you need something like this compositional to basically get anything on it. Otherwise, so you can't even do it at the moment with quantum computer, the standard uh, ML. Anyway, I'm talking about doing it on a quantum computer because that's what the next thing we did. Uh, in uh, around 2020, quantum computers started to become a bit bigger. And, and we start to take the idea seriously that we can actually do these things effectively on existing quantum computers. The problem is, whatever you learned in your quantum computing course five or 10 years ago doesn't apply to modern quantum computers. Uh, I can tell you one thing, like you can't just feed your data in a quantum computer like you do in a classical computer because you basically look, lose whatever advantage you would have because the feeding of your data is already a very complex problem. Uh, so you have to come up with another thing. And, and I mean, I'm, I've been renting and comparing whatever we were doing before with DiscoCat against uh, machine learning and AI. But the way actually you now store data on a quantum computer is using machine learning. You use technique from machine learning to actually get your data on a quantum computer. You basically train, 
you train the settings of your quantum computing with some data. That's essentially what you do. I'll, I'll illustrate this now. Uh, we do this with our circuits and with our language. Uh, so basically, this was our, our, our circuit we had, Alice Hayes Bob. Now we want to turn this into something that we can actually stick in a quantum computer. And what we use now is this thing called ZX calculus. For people who have near, but a lot of people have heard about this now, but it's, 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 you got two, two kinds of Fabinius algebra. They interact like a Baal algebra, but actually a bit more. And um, so you got two kinds of these dots now, which interact with each other. So can, I can start pulling out things like that. And I can start doing some, some typical string diagram acrobacy. So what I've got now is like an initial state, Alice, an initial state, Bob. Uh, a, a gate hates here in the middle, a gate hates here in the middle. So this kind of a circuit that looks all, a lot more like you can stick on a quantum computer. Now I'm going to parameterize, I'm going to parameterize Alice by typical quantum gates. I'm going to parameterize Bob by quantum gates. I'm going to parameterize Hayes by quantum gates. And I get something like this. And this is something I can perfectly store on a quantum computer now. And then the idea is to get the date, to, to get the, the meanings of Alice, Bob and Hayes in the machine, you're going to train it. You're going to learn the meanings of Alice, Bob, and Hayes within the quantum computer by just giving it some facts, you know, uh, so some, some contextual information, and that, that would be enough to actually train the meanings of these things. Uh, so this, this is something, so this, this you do with a classical optimizer or something like that. So this is just a practical uh, machine learning problem. And uh, <clears throat> so the thing is, we, we did this. So we, we did this the first time. And it was a, it was really at the very start of COVID. I think we, for the first time, actually did some actual NLP on a quantum computer, on an existing quantum computer, and using exactly this sort of methods. You train, we train the meanings on the quantum computer, and then we ask the question, like, the does Alice love Bob, or something like that, which was not directly uh, trained in the quantum computer, but which is something you couldn't fear from all the things we had stuck in. So there was some sort of inference going on. Uh, so we did that. Um, I mean, quantum computers grow. So meanwhile, we did it bigger. We, we, we have more people. So that's cool. And now you can just do it too. You can just do it too. So we, we basically took all the software which we had developed uh, to, to do all this NLP on a quantum computer, made it like, usable for, uh, for, for the more general user. And we brought it out and we called it Lambeck with a little Q at the end. And then we had like, we had like weeks of discussion whether the L at the beginning should be a Lambda or not or to refer to compositionality, but then people couldn't type it. So it became, it stayed just a little L. So, okay, so, so Lambeck is back as a, as, a, as, a, as a software package, basically, which is very interesting because Lambic himself never touched a computer in his life. So that's kind of a funny thing. Uh, so, okay, so this is now available, this software package Lambic, and lots of people, we have a Discord site of lots of users where they ask questions and all that. So lo lots of people are doing this now themselves, this uh, natural language processing on a quantum computer. Uh, okay, so, I mean, I mentioned, I mean, I've got my slides on Lambic, so we got a lot of, we got a lot of covering because this was kind of a, an important thing, I guess. And uh, I mean, I mean, I don't know. So, so it's it's kind of um, you may think it's a weird business choice to to produce all that stuff and then just make it open access. But I'm convinced it's a very good choice. And I know sort of Ross, Ross Duncan has spent a lot of work building a quantum compiler, which uses also a lot of the X calculus, and it's just the best thing in the world. And it's all also open access. Uh, also, this open source, not open access, open source software. I mean, yeah, so that's, that's a business decision we make. We make everything available to the world. So be, behind the scene, oh, part, part of Lambic is probably very important. Part of the software is called something DiscoPy, and that's a general package to work with monoidal categories. That's just not just about like this, this linguistic stuff. You can do lots and lots of stuff with monoidal categories with that. DiscoPy, which was initially started by Alexis Toomey and Giovanna Flixi. I think they had a talk. Yeah, they had a paper about that, I think, at, at, at the last ACT, I think. Uh, so, so you can find a paper in the last ACT proceedings about DiscoPy, but DiscoPy has grown a lot since then. And it's, it's a lot more capable. And so it's not about this, it's work with general 
uh, monoidal category theory stuff. Okay, so here is the, I think the slides are gonna made available. Here is where you can find uh, descriptions and papers and uh, software of uh, Lambic. And we, a new version is gonna come out. A new version is gonna come out very soon, uh, in, in a few weeks, I think, which has a lot more extra features. Right. Uh, okay, so I, I mentioned before that there was a potential quantum uh, for like this question answering with this coquette that there was a potential uh, uh, quadratic speed up. Now, quadratic speed up is not, I mean, it's important. That's the speed up you get for, for quantum search, but it's, it's not yet exponential, let's say it like that. It's not exponential speed up. Uh, and so we now believe that we can also get exponential speed up for uh, linguistics on a quantum computer. Um, so this is, I mean, I referred to Richard Feynman before saying that uh, if you're gonna put something on a, some, if you've got a quantum mechanical stuff thing, which is quantum mechanically described, like most chemical things now, most materials, material research, you have to put in a quantum computer. The situation is now that to discover a new drug or to just do something, so, so, some new chemical you want to use for a carbon capture, because I know green, green is very important at Topus. And, and, and for this sort of problems, you have to do it just by trial and error experimentally. You can't do it by using a computer and compute the behavior because these things just can't be described on classical computers because of their quantum description. So there's a lot of, a lot of areas which are basically waiting for a quantum computer. All, of, of course, also a lot of pharmacy, like to test a new medicine in principle, that sometimes it takes 10 years and stuff like that because you can't compute things. Uh, so there is a lot of expectation that quantum computers will, will then speed up these processes enormously because you can just compute them. And basically what you do then is like you take some circuit, you represent the evolution of a system as some quantum circuit, and then you compute what it evolves to. Now, you take a circuit and you compute what it evolves to. It's very much the same thing that I was talking about with my language circuits. So a text progresses, and at the end, you basically have the representation of the entire meaning of the entire text. So suppose you want to ask something to this test that's equally hard as asking something about a chemical uh, after a certain evolution. It's equally hard and it's the same type of description. So we expect that, I mean, we just start to properly research into this because it's very complex research. And what makes it particularly difficult is at least in chemistry, you've got an exact description of the chemical. We are working with a text. What is a text? Which text? So it makes it all a little bit more difficult to, 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 to throw a bunch of maths at it than, or a complexity theory than, than it would be with like the evolution of a chemical. But we're starting to do it. And we do, we definitely me, I expect at least exponential speed up for uh, certain tasks in, in natural language processing. If we can basically treat text as an evolution on a quantum computer. Uh, I mean, this is why, why all the people are throwing so much money at quantum computing, the chemical side initially. But uh, in, the, in, in the last reviews, people got really excited about the fact that NLP would fall under the same umbrella, of course. Uh, okay, so, so here, here is a, now my conjecture-like simulation, which typically is understood to be exponential. Some people say even uh, doubly exponential. Okay, that's where, where we are now. Uh, okay, so, so far, I've only talked about natural language, only about natural language. I said nothing about anything else or more broad AI, except in the beginning when, when I sort of gave a discussion of general AI. So now I'm gonna sort of broaden my scope and a language is only one mode of perception or communication of whatever you want to call it, uh, of the more broad cognitive spectrum of, of, of how we interact, how we perceive, how we, uh, yeah, do, do, do whatever we do. Yeah? So, so let's, let's talk a bit broader about compositional cognition. So, um, I mean, there was already some work. I mean, I said Robin is here in the public. Uh, Robin worked on that at a time. And, and what we try to do is like, these vector spaces are in a way very dumb. A vector space is a, as, as dealt with in, um, in machine learning is just a bunch, it's just statistics. So statistics is like the brute force summary if you don't know, if you don't have any better structures to work with at a time uh, or, or to understand things. So we said, let, let's try to do the same thing with some more informed structures. 
And there are quite a bunch of them around, like uh, there, there is a theory of what's called conceptual spaces developed by a, a developmental psychologist, Garden Force. And these people, they come up with all kinds of convex structures, which are natural representation for different things. So you kind of, I mean, the simplex, the, the, the taste simplex is an easy example. Then you've got this sort of color spindle, which is a bit more sophisticated, and you can come up with a lot more. And a lot of these, basically, they refer to our senses. There are, there, there are also conceptual spaces for musical perception, for example. There are conceptual spaces for lots and lots of things. They're, they're building one for, for smells and all that. And so the question is, can we have the same sort of compositional theory, like I've been talking about, uh, that we have for combining words, for actually combining concepts more generally? And so in that paper here, we showed that you can do perfect reasoning with these more general spaces in a different category. And, and you, you get, so, so grammar kind of seems to naturally be the place where also you combine these sort of things. So separate sort of concepts in it, because all these things interact. Like sometimes when, when some people associate certain smells with certain colors, certain sounds with certain colors. And so all this association, mean you have to find some structures that make all these things interact in an interesting way. So we were able to make all this conceptual space interact. This is kind of old word, almost five years old now. Uh, much more recently, we did, we did something similar for music, for music generation and music perception. So, so, so we, we, we have this thing called Quanthoven, which you also can play with. It's also out there as a piece of software. And we basically used the natural language structure, like, like the grammars, the grammars to actually, as grammars for music, and we start to do some things like, uh, it, it was mainly like uh, generating a sense of what, what a quantum computer may, can find good music. Now you don't have to, this, this is, these are still small things. We are doing this on effective hardware, on effective quantum hardware, and they're still fairly small things. So you can't do that much, but at least, at least the one thing, the one success we had was, that we be, that we produced something which actually became number one in the classical charts. So we were classical one, uh, number one in the classical charts. So that's so that's, that's the first time uh, <laughs> I came close to anything like that. So that was pretty pretty cool uh, that our thing ended up there. So so it got so yeah. I mean that was was kind of a nice thing. So in the remainder of time, so so I didn't give much, much details here. I'm going to give a little bit more detail on this. So this is a paper with Vincent Wang. And this is about, okay, I was talking about smell, I was talking about uh, uh, music, I was talking about uh, colors and stuff like that. But really the most important sort of space for us is physical space, the space in which we move, the space in which we see images. Like if I look around here in my room, I mean, it's all in physical space. The way the, 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 so so it's, it's very important for us physical space. And so we want to basically get the same sort of grammatical reasoning working for physical space, specifically physical space. And there, there, are, there are motivations from language to do that because of a lot of, a lot of linguistic meanings, like prepositions like in, next to, after, on, whatever, they, they all have spatial interpretations. They have purely spatial interpretations. So it would be stupid to actually use statistics to describe them. No, you want to basically use their spatial meaning to describe them. Many words like chasing, you see a chase uh, here at the bottom. Th these are purely uh, purely spatial concepts, spatial temporal, spatial temporal concepts. And also space is of course a key reference for uh, embodiment where we live and referencing. A lot of when we, when we talk, we actually refer to the place where we are, some, something lying in the room. We make a lot of uh, references to space. And I mean, I, I believe, and I, that's not me, I've, I've, I've seen other people have said that in the past, that's, that physical space really may be the theater of language origin, that, that the way language, especially grammar, shaped itself was directly related to the way physical space works. So, so that's the story I want to look into now. Uh, what is physical space? The, I mean, there are, there are different possible ones. So the first is like a very bad description of, of, of an Euclidean space. Then you've got a subway. This is the Hong Kong subway. Uh, a chessboard is a space. And then, yeah, Penrose staircase is weird space, but it's a space. So the first one you would think of. And the sort of thing we want to do is, if you see a sentence like this, this is now just a grammatical sentence, the pawn next to a king that an eye can capture. Really, 
needs to identify, in, for example, in this particular chessboard, the pawn next to the king that an eye can capture, which is the one indicated in green. It's the it's the so the single one which does this. So we can make this can we make this grammatical reasoning really identify this? And you want to even do more. You also want to know that if Orpheus chases a rich a and a is in Hades, then Orpheus is likely also in Hades. So th so this basically you want to do inferences which have to do with the sort of spatial connotations once you bring the spatial structure in. So how do we do this? Bob, Very nice. We're running a little low on time. Just uh, if you could wrap up pretty soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the last bit. So this, this is very quick. So you take a monoidal subcategory of rel. Uh, you in it, you you look at spatial relations. We call them spatial relations, and then you got the usual composition, and you got relations like this: move right, move uh, king's move, uh, next stop for for space station. You can come up with these things, and I'm just going to do it very quickly. Uh, you basically can represent, of course, in the category of relations, all your grammar. And what you get now is that you take this sentence and then you can basically just go through a computation. I'm not going to do it in detail. You can find this in the paper. And ultimately, you will identify uh, the, the writing. I'm just going to... So, so one thing I'm quickly going over is that you have to uh, extend your notion of space a little bit because different chess, chess pieces have different spatial capabilities. And that's also going to come in into this theory. It's one of the more interesting things of this theory, the way the spatial capabilities of agents interact with the structure of the space. Anyway, so, so that's possible. And now you can start to combine all these different things. And uh, I'll stop here. I'll stop here. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, let's all unmute and clap if you can. Or there's uh, claps in the in the, the chat as usual. So thanks, Bob. That was great. Um, we have time for some questions. Uh, I see somebody in the in the chat asked something. Seth, do you want to unmute or? Well, it's just a brief question. It's in the chat. I asked. Uh, so you mentioned Frege as a characteristic of one one generation and post Frege. Could you s explain what those are, Frege <laughs> versus post Frege? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what, what my slide here is about. So, so, so I wrote this paper, compositionality, as we see it around us, and that, that where I, that's where I explain all the differences. So, so Frege like I say, is that the meaning of the whole should only depend on the meanings of its parts. And, um, but an interesting thing is that Frege himself said, never ask for word meaning in isolation, but only in the context of a sentence. With both, with con th these two are contradictory. Because in the first case, you say, from the meaning of the words, you can get the meaning of the sentence. And then he says, you can only get the meaning of the word if you have the meaning of a sentence. And uh, it's not just the meaning oh. of a sentence, it's, it's the, the meaning of the broader text. So, so you've got these yeah. flows of information which can go bottom up, but also top down. In modern machine learning, it's clearly top down. So, so, so it, it basically means we, we all, in this community, we say compositionality, compositionality, but we have no definition for compositionality, basically. The only official definition for compositionality is, pre, is Frege, and that's not what we're doing. Especially, for mm. example, in quantum stuff, you don't get the meaning of the whole from the meaning of the parts. If you take an entangled oh. state, then the parts have no meaning. They're just noise. So oh. in, the, in the way we're using string diagrams these days is much more general way than the traditional notion of compositionality in linguistics and also the traditional notion of compositionality in computer science. And mm -hmm. I mean, the paper, I'm just sort of setting the stage for a discussion. I, I, I introduce some new notions. I introduce a notion of Schrodinger compositionality, which is supposed to be much more general and, and pretty much what we are doing in you know, all what we do. What we're doing is not Frege, it's, it's, it's what, what I call now Schrodinger compositionality. Oh, yeah. But there's a lot more space for definition and characterization there. It's something which this community, I'm now talking the ACT compositionality community, should think a bit more about because we can't just keep on using that word compositionality without knowing what we're talking about. And that by many people, it actually will be misinterpreted. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, and it looks like there's another person. A Zoom user is this person's name. Um, 
or there's one in the chat if we're gonna wait on Zoom user. Uh, some uh, Rich Hilliard um, asks, uh, given the exponential expense that quantum NLP community looked at, oh, has the quantum NLP community looked at previous work on efficiency or economy of grammatical theories to apply? Uh, so so the, the thing which, so there has been some work to try to get uh, structure back in, um, in, in, in the machine learning things, but it hasn't been working very well. And, and my interpretation is that, it's more than interpretation, it's really the structural mismatch of the, the, of the traditional uh, symbolic structures that have been used. You don't want to use a pre-group and sort of encode this one way or another in, um, with, with your uh, machine learning stuff. You really want to take this full-blown category and have the stru structures of like that. And that sort of stuff had never been done before. Uh, people are trying to use some, trying to incorporate some traditional AI logic in machine learning. It's, it's, it's not working very well. Although there are, what is the, what is the name? Neuro, uh, Valera pro probably knows the name, the Neuro, Louis Lamp, and uh, who are these people? Valeria probably knows this, who I'm referring to. Yeah, well, I, Valeria has a, yeah. Uh, I kind of don't know exactly the work, but sorry. Yeah. There's a big program there going on, but the machine learning people don't take it very serious. But I mean, for me, the machine learning people are the string theoreticians of the 90s. They think they're going to solve everything with the brutal hammer, just like the string theoreticians were going to solve everything too. They didn't solve much in the end. Machine learning has its successes, so it's a little bit different in that way. Okay, so I think Zoom user has been Lee in the past. So if Lee wants to open, unmute. Or maybe it's a different Zoom user. Yeah, no, it's, ah. it's, it's, it's Lee. Oh, thanks for this fantastic talk. I, I, I just had a question, Bob, about your last comment about physical space as a theater of origin. It, it rang a, a connection in my mind, and I wondered what you think of it. Lakoff and Johnson, you know, in their book, uh, Metaphors We Live By, so much of what he talks about has to do with uh, the physical metaphors underlying logic, or so what we think of as logic. And I was wondering whether you, um, you know, have been mining any of Lakoff and Johnson's um, explorations of the of of this rather deep, um, you know, study of metaphor in in your work. Oh, well, I mean, we, we, we didn't go, there's some people in my team who are starting to think about uh, metaphor and, 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 and things like that. Now, the place where I got this thing about the physical space from was, was really also from Garden Force. Garden Force in his books, he writes, and he probably gets it from them. He yes. also writes a lot about, uh, he, he thinks in, in Newtonian mechanic terms and movement about verbs and, and grammatical structures and things like that. So that's where we got it from. He's, he's a very intriguing person, Garden Force. I mean, yeah. it's more intriguing in person when you speak to him than, than from his books. Yeah. Because he, 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 relativi he relativizes everything. He says, yeah, yeah I wrote yeah. that book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Lakoff and Johnson book, you know, as classical as it is, a gold mine of very provocative uh, connections. Uh, that's why I, I, I you okay, know, I was, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Got it. Got thanks, it. Lee. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, Valeria? Hi, Bob. Mm -hmm. Kind of, it was a very wonderful uh, landscape of, of how the work came to be, came to be and stuff. Very interesting. Um, I, I have more of a comment, as if I may. I, I think okay. one that worries me about that is this business of coming to uh, the traditional physicist arrogance of coming to a field and trying to <laughs> explain to our forefathers what they are doing wrong. So, you know, I, I kind of worry a little bit that um, you kind of, you know, you could only, I mean, that, and not only you, right? Lumbach too, right? And somehow, uh, you know, the Lumbach stuff never kind of caught on into computational linguistics, even when it was very symbolic, because it couldn't do much of the coverage that people expected it to do. At least that's my impression. And, and you know, I, I think the Lumbeck calculus by itself 
itself is a log it's a lovely logical system and you know i've done work on that myself yeah. but i think it's as as a tool for understanding language is a little bit primitive and it doesn't do as much as we want it and and you know it, it, and i think i can see a little bit of that i mean and that's where the question comes in I, I, yeah can, I, I can comment on that so i think i think it, it was the naivety of especially the pre groups was very good for us to be able to do something because otherwise we would have just drowned you, you understand what i'm saying so so it was just it was a very it's like oh anything like the physicist says everything in the world is a point <laughs> something like that so but in the la the last paper which i was planning to send to you by the way uh, today or tomorrow we we actually start with generative grammars right that, that, which, that, which, that, 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 that a bit more of attention to the the guys who actually have been doing that for the last 50 or 60 years yeah so so it's 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 so it's a much more general modern and we actually mathematically now also understand much better we actually i mean it's not in the paper yet I've got, we've got a conjecture on what is the difference between these sort of typical lambda grammars and these sort of things mathematically so which is also an important thing to understand actually that's great i'm looking forward to that so But yes the, the, a little bit of it was a question because this one was a comment right the But question was a little bit about um i think that this latest work that you described about spatial reasoning kind of makes clear to me at least that that there was more than needed to be done than than simply um thinking about pregroups right because you know sure. the, the reasoning with the space is something that some of these old guys uh kind of could already do and um, with kind of more traditional methods but but you know i am very excited about seeing this whole whole stuff and particularly excited about um i mean i have my own version of how to put um um com machine learning bert and and such like transformers together with logic and and you say louis lamb and and and, and the guys there have a, a different one too and you know i think there will be lots of others and and that's all very good because we need them so mm. i'm kind of really looking forward to seeing your new stuff um, i need okay. to <laughs> yeah no but but i agree like with, with what you say the, the the problem is uh i mean uh when you, when you try to bring ideas from different disciplines together you can't know everything <laughs> and 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 the biggest problem is like academia isn't very supportive for these things it's impossible to get a grant for these things so now we are in a lucky position that we are not in academia anymore and we can actually do it absolutely i totally agree you know it's much more possible to kind of exchange kind of further ideas quickly nowadays so yeah. yes okay well i th thanks valeria for the for the question um and bob thanks again for your talk this was great um thank you bob again and we'll stop the recording and um and the live stream and if any